business that I want to We'll uh, we'll go ahead and get uh, get started. Many of you know Tim very well. Um, uh, some of you, I'm sure, even changed his diapers at some point <laughs> in the church nursery uh, uh, 50 years ago. Or so, if you, yeah, right. So, uh, um, thanks, Tim, for, for coming and, and sharing. I, I was telling Tim, yeah, we primed the pump. We looked at the parable of the dishonest manager. Man, we're, we're the ones that are supposed to be masters of these tools and using them for good. And so we have the privilege of somebody who's uh, been a master at studying and using these tools for, what did you say, 27? 27 years. 27 years. So... Uh, um, great to be able to learn from uh, your experience. Um, so thanks again for uh, just uh, giving your time and giving us your your wisdom and insight. Well, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. And we got about three, four people uh, online. So we'll um, uh, if questions come up from them, I'll throw them to you. Just throw them to me. So um, just as further introduction. Um, so I've grown up in this church. I've been here forever. Um, I have lots of great memories. Lots of great memories of going to Sunday school and youth group with Matt Madison in the crowd here. So good to be back and, and talk to you about finances. So professionally, I've been with Johnson Investment Council for 27 years. So work on the investment side, financial planning side, working with clients to assess what their objectives are, um, come up with an investment strategy and financial plan to accomplish their objectives. Um, but in addition to that, one of my passions has been working with Christian clients, and not all my clients are Christian, but those who are, um, working with them on stewardship concepts, thinking through how to manage money well from a stewardship perspective, <coughs> and looking at things from a biblical view and an eternal perspective. And about 10 years ago, um, I studied further in this, and there's some of you may be familiar with um, uh, a person named Ron Blue. So he's a prominent Christian financial um, guru, I guess you would say. So Larry Burkett was back in the 70s and 80s. Ron Blue was um, a contemporary of his. So he was a very successful um, money manager, and then he felt like God had called him not to work with clients, but instead work with Christian advisors and equipping them to help their clients uh, from a stewardship perspective. So he started a ministry to advisors called Kingdom Advisors. So I've been a part of that and chief designation through that and ongoing education, looking at um, a biblical lens of money. So, um, so this is right down my alley, so I really appreciate the chance to to be here and talk to you. So the title of this particular presentation is Basic Investment Principles. So this is not going to be um, super duper um, sophisticated, but if you have more questions that are a little bit deeper, feel free to ask during the presentation or after, that's fine. But I'm not going to drill down to a, a really detailed level. It's designed just to look at things at a macro big picture level, but hopefully you'll find it helpful. So why the, the, the basic investment principles, we're looking at investments from um, an academic standpoint, but again, we're looking at them through a biblical lens. So that's, that's the angle that I'm coming from uh, when we look at everything here today. So we can go ahead and just jump right in. And if you have comments or questions, this is a small group. So just go ahead and ask questions. It'll be more interesting if we have um, dialogue versus me just lecturing for an hour and 15 minutes. But the concept of money itself is really important to think about because um, there are lots of different views in the world today about what money is and what it, how we view it, how we, would, how we should treat it. Um, and there are misconceptions about that from a secular standpoint and also from a Christian standpoint. So sometimes from a Christian standpoint, we can view money as a bad thing. It's evil. It's the source of evil. 
Um, but it's not. It's it, it, it's a tool. It's a good thing if, if if used in that way. So the so the Bible says, money is not the root of evil, but the love of money can be the root of evil. So there's a big difference. Money itself, not evil, but how you view it could be evil. And so you have to have the right mindset about it. And there's tons of verses in the Bible about that. And one thing I'll talk about today is the Bible talks a ton about money. So I'm not going to tell you how many verses because that we're going to get that to that later. But God knows that money is pulling us constantly, just as humans. It's one of those things that pulls us that not everybody, but most people, it's something that we live for. We want more. We can do more. We can achieve more. We can buy more and impress more. So it's part of our nature to want it. So um, he knows how important it is. So he speaks about it a lot. Um, and I think the last sermon that you had talked about stewardship, management, being responsible, accountable for the money that God entrusts us. So he cares what we do with it. So at one point in time, down the road, we are going to be accountable to God on what we did with the money that he entrusted us. And so that is a big thing to think about. And we should not be surprised when that happens someday because he's told us in the Bible over and over and over how important it is and how we will be held accountable for it. And that can be a good thing if we handle it wisely. Um, another misconception is it's the key to happiness, and that would be a secular perspective. If the more money you have, the happier you are. And there's tons of examples in this world full of it. Uh, the more money you have can actually lead to the opposite. And you know, an, an easy example to, to, to look at in that lens is just what happens to lottery winners. You know, they win the lottery. That's what they've always wanted to do. That was their life dream to win the lottery. So they win it. They buy things that they always think they wanted. And then their life goes downhill and all kinds of problems result. So in some cases, and in some cases, many situations, the more money you have, it can lead to opposite. And another example I will give about that where I see the opposite of that is where my wife is from. So Honduras, very, very humble. Um, people there don't have a 401k, they're not saving in Roth IRAs, and they're, they're just subsiding, subsistence um, type living. Very, very simple, but very, very happy. So they're not encumbered by all the things that we are, all the entrapments that we are. A simple life without a whole lot of money can be um, very satisfying. So. It's not the key to happiness. Um, and another that one... That isn't all that idyllic either. I remember being down there and being <laughs> you or somebody pointing out the fact you'd be going along and here'd be somebody who had a concrete block house or a concrete house instead of the ones made out of the bamboo or stuff and say, well, I have relatives that were working in the U.S. and sent them back money. That's right. That's where the money comes from. So the third point is not just happiness, but more financial freedom. So money can provide financial freedom, but it can also create more financial bondage the more you have. So it's, it's a double-edged sword. Um, and then misconception, it all belongs to me. So I'm in control of it. It's up to me what happens to it. I'm responsible for it. I can do whatever I want with it without any accountability. So. Bible is totally contrary to that. The Bible is, is countercultural by nature, and money is a perfect example of that. And then, if I only had more money, that's the way a lot of people live. I mean, if I only, I could tithe if I had more money. I could help people more if I had more money. If I had more money, I would be happy. If I had more money, I could do this or that. So that's always chasing the wind. Because if they had more, then they would want even more. Um, so that is a misconception. So the biblical view of money, we could just fill this with Bible verses. Um, but one basic one is Psalm 24, 1, where the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, 
So that includes money. It all belongs to him. There's so many examples. Um, the story of Job at the end, it's God says, look, it's all mine. Everything you're mine, your money's mine, it's all mine. So if we view our finances that way, it doesn't necessarily take the responsibility away, but it does take some of the pressure off that we don't know what, what's around the corner. We don't know what's going to happen in the market next month or next quarter or next year. But God wants us to be wise. He wants us to move forward in a prudent way. But it's not all on us. It doesn't belong to us. We're just trying to do the best we can. So misconceptions. So that gets into stewardship. So what is a steward? Like the, the basic um, definition would be a manager. So he's entrusted us assets to manage, to be responsible for. So it's not just money. It's not just possessions, even though the Bible talks about both of those um, a lot. But time and talents are just as important. So we are stewards of our time. We are stewards of the talents that God has given to us. And so we're accountable for all of these. Um, what are we doing with those in a way that pleases God um, during our lifetime? So these are not separate, but they're all interrelated because God gives us time. He gives us talents. And he expects us to work hard and be industrious. And that usually results in making some money. And so money, again, is not evil. Part of our design is to work. Work is good. It doesn't mean you have to work in the highest paying industry. You may work in an industry that's not as high paying. But typically, you do make money for what you do. And then what do we do with that money? Um, so it's a balancing act. So money is used to live on. That's a biblical concept. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to take care of our family. That is very clear in the Bible. We have to look out for our family. And then we have to look out for the church and building God's kingdom. So it's a balance. We have to look out for the future. So Proverbs talks about building up. The, the ants gather food for the, for the, well, I'm trying to think what it is. So the, the sluggards and the ants. So you have to work. You have to get food. You've got to save. You've got to look toward the future. The next season, you have to be ready for it. So you look toward the future, you look for our family, you look for us, and you look for God's kingdom, balancing that in a way that's um, good management of the funds. So what is the ultimate objective? And this gets to the good manager. Luke, we may have talked about this on Sunday, but God will evaluate us as managers, given what we have and given our ability to do so. We will be held responsible for that. So just, again, one verse, tons of verses we could put on this. So then we get into investing, um, some misconceptions about investing. Investing is only for rich people who have a lot of money. Well, that's not true. Um, investing in some fashion is available for all of us. We may have different amounts to invest, but it's a principle that we should all follow to the extent that we can. There are ways for everyone to invest that are simple and cost effective. You don't have to have connections on Wall Street to invest. You don't have to um, have a PhD in finance or investments to figure it out. There's simple ways to do it, and we'll talk about that. Um, the deck is stacked against small investors, so that is not true. Now, do some things go on in the markets where People on the inside and hedge funds, do they might know something that we don't possibly? Could they benefit from some things that we don't, as typical investors, benefit from possibly? But in general, the market is designed so everyone can win. So it's not a zero-sum game where I, if I make money, Barry loses. We can both invest. Better not. Better not, that's right. Um, but if we're all investing, we're all investing in the free enterprise system. So that tide can lift up all boats. So we can all win from it. And then investing is like gambling. Some people have the misconception that you know, if I invest in the stock market, that's like going to Belterra or something. Now, if you are on Robinhood 
and if you're buying GameStop every day and trading it during the day. And if you don't know what that means, that's been a big thing for the last six months. So even my daughter's friends in high school last year were buying stocks on this platform called Robinhood. So that would be gambling, in my opinion. But if you're investing in companies longer term, not trying to guess when to get in and out, then you're participating in the free enterprise system. That is not gambling, that is investing. So there's a big difference. So this next point, this is, this is somewhat related, but this is very, very interesting. So when I meet with clients over the years, everyone has a different perspective on money, whether they're Christian or not. They have a philosophy about it. And so in many, many cases, it's very dictated by their upbringing. So if someone was raised with a Depression era parent, they view money as something that you store away and you don't touch because you may need it. And so that mindset is ingrained in them and it's difficult for them to break away. And then others were raised where money was pretty free flowing. So, or in a household where investing was talked about. And some grew up in a household where investing was not an option. They never heard about it. Their parents couldn't save. So how someone views money, views investment, views what they do with it, it's very correlated to how they grew up. So one of the questions that I will ask, because this is interesting too, husband and wife may come from totally different backgrounds when it comes to money. So one's a spender, one's a saver. I see it all the time. And so, and it doesn't necessarily mean one is the other. I've seen both. The wife's a saver, the husband's a spender. It's, it's both, it's equal. Um, but I will ask them, what was money like when you grew up? Then their backgrounds would be totally different. So their philosophies are totally different and they're trying to mesh them together. And in some cases they're 60 or 70 years old and they're still trying to mesh it together. So it's just an interesting one to think through because how as parents, our lifestyle, how we handle money, our kids are observing that. And so if, if we exhibit good habits, hopefully they're, they're noticing that. If not, it can be the flip side. So it's just, it's very interesting. It's something that we pass on. So that was kind of related to misconceptions about investing, but I just wanted to talk about that. So before we get into anything more, we're gonna have a little quiz. So I wish I had a reward, but I don't. Um, so I will read the questions for those who are Zooming. So if you have a pen or pencil, go through. Do the best you can, we'll grade it. We'll see who, who is the champion. You're not allowed to look at your phones. So the first question is, true or false, the Bible has over 2,300 verses about money and possessions. Second one is the Dow Jones Industrial Average represents how many companies? So it's tracking how many. And true or false, the Bible says that Christians should limit their giving to 10% of income. True or false, then true or false, bank CDs have provided an annual return of 5% over the last decade. Fifth one is the largest company in the world based upon stock value is what? And what did Einstein describe as the eighth wonder of the world? Fill in the blank. Next one is Warren Buffett was the founder of the US stock market, true or false? stock market had its poorest year in a decade last year, 2020, resulting from the pandemic, true or false. Cincinnati's home to seven 
Fortune 500 companies, true or false? Can you name any of them? Bonus. Next one's true or false. This is a simple one. But those who don't invest in the stock market have a tough time growing their nest egg. And the last one's open-ended. What is the best eternal investment? It's not Amazon. That's, that's fine. It's my hint. And actually, I do have a prize for the winner. It's not mine. It's a book that talks about money. So I, ha I happen to have an, act an extra copy of my car that I will give to the winner of this quiz. Could be. It's biblical. He who has gets more. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when it could be a good, good steward and give it away. We'll do two more minutes and then we'll we'll go through and We'll go through this. This, since we're in a church, this is the honor system. So we, we expect everyone to, to 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 grade accurately. Um, so the first one, true or false? The Bible has t over twenty three hundred verses about money and possessions. The answer is false. True. Is it true? It's true. Depending how you look it up, some it's 2,350, somewhere around there. Some say 2,400. So the, the answer to the first one is true. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, Sam Stair, what is your guess on this one? I can tell you what the Fortune 500 is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, 1,400. Uh. Barry. 30. 30. 30, 30 yeah. Nice. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, 30. 30. I thought it was 2,300, they based it on the Bible. <laughs> so in the old days, well, not in the old days, but the Dow used to be the measure of the stock market based upon 30 companies. So the Dow as a measure has become a little bit outdated because 30 is not as representative. So now it's the S&P 500 is more the kind of the benchmark for the market because it has 500 companies. Um, but the Dow is 30. True or false, the Bible says that Christians should limit their giving to 10% of income. False. False. 
True or false, bank CDs have provided an annual return of over 5% the last decade. False. False. Do you know what it is? Um, well, I don't know for sure. Probably, depending on the term of the CD, probably 2 or 3%. Yeah. And that's going down. Yeah. You can't get that today. The largest company in the world based upon stock value is... It's Apple. Apple. I was going to say, for Brian Madison and Barry Stair, it's not a PNG. <laughs> so everybody with iPhones, you're contributing to that. What did Einstein describe as the eighth wonder in the world? Compound interest. Compound interest. Who got that one right? Did you get it? I did. Compound interest. Wow. Which will play into our investment theme later. Warren Buffett was the founder of the stock market. It was actually Tim Johnson. So. The stock market had its poorest year in a decade in 2020, true or false? False. False. Now, if the year would have ended in March, the answer would have been yes. It fell 35% in a month, but then rebounded and wound up having a good year. For real, I'm sure. It was, yeah. pretty, it was pretty incredible. Cincinnati's home to seven Fortune 500 companies, true or false? True. Is that still true? Yeah, I said false. I thought it changed. It's still true. Can you name three of them? Besides Procter and Gamble. Kroger. 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 Kroger's actually. Centos. Centos is one. Uh, and Cincinnati Yes. Uh, Western Fifth Southern? Fifth Third Bank. Uh, Western Southern. Uh, one other one. Is, is GE Aviation a separate company? No. 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 Great American. Uh, the next one's pretty easy. Those who don't invest in the stock market have a really tough time growing their nest egg. True or false? That is true. If you're not participating in the stock market, very tough to grow your nest egg. You just have to be, you have to be in it. What is the best eternal inv investment? Jesus. The treasure in heaven, yeah. since we're talking about money. Which, Drew could talk about that for a sermon series that could last for decades, but. Um, there's an announcement. The message had a really good thing on that. God talking to the guy who built bigger barns. Yeah. You have filled your barns with self instead of with God. Yeah. So self grading. What was your score? Anybody have all of them right? Miss one? Miss two. Well, well, if nobody else missed just one, then. There's the winner. And as the winner, you get a copy of the book. It's called Managing God's Money by Randy Alcorn. If you haven't read it, it's really good. It's a quick read and recommend that you get it. So I'll give that to you afterwards. But one of the things that he talks about in his book, and it's also in the Treasure Principle, if you've ever read that, it's really good. It's thinner, but it's a really, really good book. And he talks about money that we have today on this earth it's like Confederate money back during the Civil War. So that money was great for a while while you're living in the South. But when the tide turned in the war, of course, it was worth nothing. And after the Civil War, it was worth nothing, absolutely nothing. So that's the way our money and possessions are today. It's eventually not worth anything in light of an eternal perspective. So 
the purpose of our existence should not be to build barns full of Confederate currency. I mean, that's kind of where he heads, because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter that much. So the foundation of saving investing. So before we get into the stock market and um, the bond market and how to invest and make the most of your resources, the foundation before you even do that is to make sure you have reserves for a rainy day. So you have to check that off the list first. And the stats on that are really amazing. How many people could not come up with a $400, um, or cover a $400 expense without using their credit card. The majority of people in society today could not do that. So you have to have a rainy day fund. The rule of thumb is to have about six months of cash flow reserves tucked away just for that purpose. And it's not just living expenses because you could lose your job, you could, you could be furloughed or laid off. So you, you need reserves to, to buy time, but you also need reserves because things come up in life. You don't know what will need to be fixed, but you know something will need to be fixed. The tire is going to blow out, the roof's going to leak, the water heater is going to go bad, the dishwasher is going to stop working. It's just going to be one thing after another, especially if you own a house. I mean, if you own a house, we all know what that's like. If you go a few months without anything, you know something's coming. So you have to plan for the unexpected because the unexpected will happen. You just don't know what exactly it will be, but it's coming. And a third, this is according to stats, but a third of all people have no reserves. So whatever they get, it goes out, they spend it. So within a couple months period of whatever comes in, it's gone. And whatever comes in, it's already targeted for something. So part of and this is a very, very basic concept, but part of living in a prudent way is you have to live below your means. If you live below your means, you have reserves for things that come up, and then you have an amount built in your budget to give away. Because if you spend everything that you make on yourself, how are you going to give away? How are you going to help other people? How are you going to help build God's kingdom? And this is just not for people who have a lot of money. And the Bible talks about that. So everybody's responsible for doing this, regardless of what you have. So even if you don't have much, God still expects you to do that with what you have. So it's the you know the story of the widow who puts her last you know, her last coins. In the offering plate, God saw it. Jesus saw it. So he sees everything that we do. So giving, tithing is just not for people who have way more money than they know what to do with. It's for every one of us. God is testing us on what we're doing with the money that we have. So once you have re your reserves, then you can start thinking about shorter term needs, whether it be buying a car or the roof that you know is going to be needing your pair in five years, you can start mapping out when you think you might need money. Then we have to also think about longer term. So in Honduras, where my wife is from, the retirement plan is your kids. So you take care of your kids and then your kids will take care of you. I mean, that's how it works. And there, there, there's some nice logic behind that. Um, it's family taking care of family. But in our culture, in our society today here, it's probably not the best thing. You have to look out for yourself. You have to look at the future. And if your plan is, I'll take care of it later, or eventually I'll do that, then it's not going to work. And that is the plan of most people. So most people, percentage-wise, don't have a plan for the future. They're just trying to make it through. And life is not easy. And you can see how that mentality would overcome a plan 
an investment plan, but you have to do it. You have to say, 20 years from now, what am I going to do? 30 years from now, what am I going to do? How is it going to work? So it requires a lot of foresight and forethought for an investment plan um, to be successful. So one of the keys to any plan in life, and this is not easy, is to sit down and map it out and write it down. Because a plan that's not written down has a significantly less chance of being executed. So if you write it down, and if you're married, sit down with your spouse, write it down, review it, and then make a point at least annually to say, are we on track? Or does the plan need to be amended? So it's not realistic to sit down and do this every month. Nobody would do that except for a few, except for engineers from PNG. <laughs> but for everyone else, it's not realistic to focus on this throughout the year, but at least once a year to say, how are we doing versus the plan? And what do we need to do to make sure we're on that plan? And sometimes it can be helpful to get somebody else involved to help you with that. So this is not a sales pitch by any means. It could be an advisor, it could be a friend, it could be someone else, but it's nice to have someone you can run it by who may know more than you do, or it may be good just from an accountability standpoint to get advice on the plan and to check in on it. Otherwise, if you're on your own, sometimes it's harder to, to be successful. So we could spend an entire series just on this page, but we're just, this is an overview. So, now we get into investments. So, we just talked about thinking through what you're trying to accomplish, short term, medium term, long term. Then where the investment plan comes in is saying, what are the appropriate vehicles that would be aligned with these objectives? So. A rainy day fund, you should not invest in something that's going to have a whole lot of risk of principal fluctuation, that you could lose money. That wouldn't make sense. If you need to repair the water heater in the next year, you shouldn't go to Belterra and bet it on black because it could all be gone. Um, if you invested in the stock market over the next six months, who knows? Nobody knows. You can make 10%, you can lose 20%. The longer you extend your time frame, the more appropriate it is to take on that risk. Because a concept in life that also applies to investments is there's a trade off between risk and return. So if you don't want to have any risk, you're not going to make any return. And if you want a lot of return, you have to take on some risk, just the way it works. But risk itself is not a bad thing. Because otherwise, you could say, I want to protect what I have. You could bury it in the ground. The Bible talks about that. Burying in the ground is not a good thing. So calculated risk is prudent depending on the time frame. So then it gets into compounding. And this is the eighth wonder of the world according to Einstein. So this is a this is a concept that I think most people understand, but when you really think about it, put the math to it, it's very, very powerful. Um, so the best way I thought to show them is to look at what is called the rule of 72. So the rule of 72 is you take 72 divided by your expected annual return, whatever that may be, and including or factoring in compounding, it will tell you how many years it will take to double your money. So historically, the stock market has done about 10% a year, although it does anything but 10% on a given year. It's all over the place, but 10% on average. But with that, type of expected return, no guarantee, 72 divided by 10, seven. So if the market does its thing, 
reasonably, somewhere around seven years, you can double your money. So just think about that. If you have $10,000, seven years from now, it could be 20. Seven years after that, it could be 40. So it just, it, it, it truly explodes. And the longer time frame you have, the more you can benefit from it. So that doesn't mean it's never too late to benefit from it, but the earlier you start, the more you benefit from compounding. On the flip side, if you say, I don't want to risk any principal, I don't want to have any fluctuation because I just can't sleep at night, you could stick it in a CD and make 1%, and it would take 72 years to double your money. Actually, you won't know no. because right now, this last month, we had 5% inflation, so you just lost well, 5% of that. Well, that's exactly right. Yep, so long-term money that's invested in, in bank accounts, you're, you're losing ground from a purchasing power standpoint. You're losing ground. So... From an investment standpoint, longer term, for longer term objectives, one of the primary things you're trying to accomplish is you're trying to exceed the rate of inflation. Whereas you're just, you're standing still or, or going backwards. And the only place you can do that is with stocks. It's the only place you can do it. Now, within traditional investments, now you could go off and do something else that might do better than stocks, mm -hmm. but within a traditional, approach to invest investing you're not going to keep up with inflation if you if you invest in bank accounts or bonds you're not longer term and inflation is a huge issue right now they tell us it's transitory <laughs> but those who tell you that are also very political <laughs> which is a whole nother thing because well, I won't even go there. No. But, but it's, it's very interesting. Because eventually, they're not going to be able to say it's transitory if it keeps lasting quarter after quarter. And then rates have to go up to control that. And when rates go up, the economy slows down. So it's this catch-22. So we've been in a sweet spot for almost 20 years where interest rates have been really low, inflation has been really low, the growth has been good, but that can't maintain itself forever. Because eventually if you grow, 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 then inflation starts to kick in. So, but what politician wants to have interest rates going up on their watch? Because that's going to affect economic growth. And, the, and politicians have a lot of sway, they shouldn't, but they do on the Federal Reserve who controls interest rates more and more. So it's, it's a hard one. But the point of this page is you have to have compounding work for you um, for longer term investment needs. You have to. Next page. Um, so we get into what, what are stocks. Um, So at a very basic level, stocks represent ownership in a company. So when you buy a share of PNG, you are a small fractional owner of PNG. You are an owner of that company. Um, so as an owner of the company, you do benefit from how the company does. If the company's doing well, the stock's going up. You benefit from a dividend that the company pays to, to shareholders. And over time, depending on the company, they're actually growing their dividend rate. So you're getting a little bit of raise on your dividend. Um, but you are an owner. So when you're an owner, you vote on things via proxy to, to a board of directors, and you are an owner. So several years ago, an outsider was trying to get onto the board of PNG. So if you owned PNG shares, you got to vote a proxy whether you wanted that person in or not because you're an owner of the company. So you're participating in what that company is doing. So 
this is a mis misconception for those who are not as familiar with stocks, but when you buy or sell a stock, <coughs> that money's not going to PNG. You are buying it from another investor. So PNG issues stock at some point, way back when it made the money when investors bought that initial public public offering. But after that, the stock market is, just tr is, is a trading platform between investors. Mm -hmm. So if Barry is selling PNG on the market and I want to buy PNG, then through the market, I'm buying his shares. That doesn't mean to say Barry can win and I can lose because he could have made a lot of money on PNG. He sells, I buy, and then PNG makes more money from here. We all win. But it's not going directly to the company. You're buying between other investors. And then stock market indices. So these are um, these are measures of the stock market because you say, what is the market doing? The Dow Jones Industrial Average, like I mentioned before, it's 30 companies that are in different industries, different companies that are um, material in what they do, and they supposedly represent what's going on in the in the market. This companies change depending on how they're doing and um, how relevant they are to the economy. The S&P 500, 500 companies, Russell 3000, 3000 companies, which includes small and medium sized companies. So that's even a better measure. These are all just the US stock market. So you can buy, you can buy stocks that are based in Europe, Far East, wherever it may be. And there's different measures for those markets as well. Like the Nikkei is the Japanese market. You can see what the Japanese market is doing by looking at the Nikkei. So over time, stocks over stocks have provided around a 10% annual return, but the standard deviation or the variation from that is all over the place. So stocks, interestingly, rarely perform between five and 10% a year. We'll see 20, we'll see 15, we'll see 30, we'll see minus 20, but we rarely see just like mid single digits. It just doesn't happen that much. It's going to be plus or minus 10% versus that average. So when you buy stocks, again, depending on your time frame, it could be a wild ride. So if you would have bought them last February, you lost 35% in a month. But if you bought them a month later at the end of March at the bottom, you could have made 50% by the end of the year. So it, it really depends on timing. But one of the cautions um, that I would express today is it would seem logically that you could time the market. You could say the market's high today, I'll sell, and I'll wait for a dip and then I'll buy, and I'll just get in and out, and then I can make a lot of money rather than just sitting and holding. But it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to know when to get out. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to know when to get back in. And to make that effective, you got to be good at both. Because you could get out. You could have gotten out in February of 2020 and looked like a hero. But if you would have said, I'm scared to get back in, then you would have missed out what happened the rest of 2020 and this year. So there's a phrase in the industry that a bell doesn't ring at the top and the bell doesn't ring at the bottom. So if you try to get too cute, then you can miss out. And the studies have shown, which is very interesting, if you look at decade returns, if you just miss the 10 best days of that decade, your return over that 10 years drops in half on average. Your average annual return drops by half if you just miss 10 days. So when the market comes back, it comes back strong. And really big days come when the outlook is the bleakest. So last March, we didn't know what was going to happen. But eventually, the market turned on a, on, on a dime, and nobody knew when that was coming. So with our clients, so they were positioned in a way to have cushion against that. 
So there was never need to sell when things were bad. And if anything, when things were really bad, we would say, you still have more cushion than what you need. So if the market's down 35, if anything, we would sell some of your cushion and start to nibble in when things are really low in the stock market. Not that we're trying to be heroes, but you rebalance. So when the market's doing really, really well on the stock side, and you have a balanced portfolio of growth and cushion, you sell some of the stock portion that's done really, really well, and you rebalance. But on the flip side, when the stock portion does really, really poorly, sometimes you sell cushion and add there. So there's a discipline to it that can add value over time without trying to pinpoint when to get in and in and, in and out. So having a discipline is good, but trying to time the market day to day is a loser's strategy. So the bottom line here, this last bullet point, because people ask me, well, you know, I'm concerned about the world. I'm concerned about our economic system. I'm concerned, concerned about inflation. It seems like China is becoming more dominant. Um, where are we going to fit in longer term? We don't know the answers to all of that. Um, or some, and this is a Tim Johnson quote. Some will say, well, you know, the Middle East is, you know, it's having tons of issues. And Tim Johnson will say, there's only been, there have only been issues in the Middle East for the last, you know, 3,000 years. Um, so there's always something to worry about. And if you watch the news, depending on what you watch, there's always something to discourage you about whether it be our country or the economic system or whatever it may be, there's always something to bring you down. But when you invest, at the end of the day, it's the free enterprise system. So are companies out there coming up with new products or better products that consumers or at some level will want to buy? So I believe and we believe the answer is yes. There's always something coming. There's always needs that we have. There's always needs in the future that we don't even realize we have. The companies will be out there taking advantage of it and making money. And then if you invest, then you're participating in that. So that's the bottom line when you invest in stocks. You believe there will always be companies around the world always looking to manage their operations better, come up with better products that people will want to buy. So I believe that. So I'm gonna stop for a second. Any questions, comments? Agree, disagree? So the next page is, so stocks sound interesting. How would I invest in them? So there's different ways you can do it. Um, you can buy individual stocks. You could go out, you could open up a Charles Schwab account, a Robinhood account, or whatever, you know, whatever platform. It's very simple to do. You can do it online. And you could buy shares of an individual company. So you could do that. Um, depending on the size of your portfolio, or how much you have to invest, that could make sense or less sense. For most people, stock mutual funds make more sense. So a mutual fund is a basket of stocks that has a specific objective. It could be large companies, it could be small companies, medium international, it could be growth oriented companies, all technology, it could be companies that are, that are considered value or banking and um, industrial companies, whatever it may be, they are baskets. So you're buying a share of that basket. And so as that, as that basket grows, then your proportional value would grow as well. So that is a more diversified, safer way to get stock exposure. Yeah. Would, you, would you include ETFs? Is yeah. There, is there, is there another version of mutual funds? Yeah, so an ETF is, um, so there's traditional mutual funds, 
And then there's an ETF. An ETF is a basket that you can actually trade during the day. So you could buy a basket of stocks that represent a different segment of the market. So you could buy that um, through a brokerage and then you could sell it anytime you want intraday because it's priced during the day. Um, but it, in effect, it's the same thing. It's a diversified basket of, of securities. So ETFs are very popular. But they're short term? No, these are long term. These are stocks. Okay. So we would not we would not view stocks as short term. Yeah, but I'm saying with this ETF. No, that's a basket as well. So what's the difference between that and these? There's not a huge difference, but a mutual fund, um, you can't trade during the day. So you can set you could put you could call Fidelity or mm -hmm. Vanguard, mm -hmm. give a fund and you'd say, I would like to sell my mutual fund today. It's valued at the end of the day. Whatever it's valued at, that's what you get. An ETF is a basket that's traded during the day. So you could buy it at 10 o'clock and get that price, or you could sell it at 10 o'clock and get that price. So in terms of what they are and what they would provide to you, they're very, very similar. It's just that they're traded differently. Okay. Yeah. So there's different segments, again, large, medium, small, US, international. You could buy an ETF or mutual fund that is just technology, technology stocks. You could buy one that is just Chinese internet stocks. I mean, there's all different types of baskets. So starting off as a core or as a foundation, we'd recommend funds that are broad-based international, primarily larger companies, and then you use that as a base, and then you supplement around that with medium, small, international, or a fund that focuses on whatever it may be. But to have that core foundation of US high quality companies is our, which is our point of view. The most important thing is to be diversified. So funds are a great way to do that. Invest in stocks for the longer term. Talk about that. These are not short-term trading vehicles. That's gambling. Um, and you hold on, and then you'll be rewarded longer term. And that's what history tells us, and there's no reason to believe otherwise in the future. So the on this page mentioned sales commissions. Mm -hmm. um, what's a good way to kind of read through all the different Commissions or expense ratios? Yeah. Like, is there a good resource? Well, if, if you're buying an ETF, the expense ratios are really low, depending on what you're buying. But if you're in a, if you're buying, buying a broad-based U.S. ETF, the expenses are going to be very low. It's hard to go wrong. Um, if you're buying a mutual fund, expenses can be a, a traditional mutual fund. It can be a little bit higher, depending on where you buy that fund. So, for example, and I'm. This is just informational, but like at a traditional bank, if you, have, if you have a larger balance there, they usually have their own securities arm at a bank. And they may approach you and say, you have a lot of money in your bank account. Why don't you buy a mutual fund? Oftentimes, mutual funds that are sold to you will have a commission attached to them. So maybe an upfront or they get out when you get out. Correct. So they're called sales loads. So you could pay, pay a load to get in. So that comes right out uh, of what you, you invest. Yeah. Or the, the other alternative would be you don't pay a load up front. They charge you a little bit higher expense ratio along the way. And they penalize you if you get out within five or six years. So anything that is sold to you tends to be more expensive. So I would do your own research, um, stick to a broad-based fund, and then you know buy it on your own rather than going through a salesperson. What in just in general, mm -hmm. what are the three? 
companies that you usually tell folks that are average investors? Hey, here's For smaller, let's say smaller uh -huh. investors, um, a broad-based mutual fund that would be relatively low expense would be a Vanguard. Um, and so Vanguard has a total stock market index fund. Or the, the you could buy an ETF. So if you're on Charles Schwab, there's one that um, it's broad-based Vanguard index fund. The ticker is VTI. You can buy that. So it's very low expense. It'll track the stock market. Um, you know, Fidelity would have comparable ones um, to, to start off as a smaller investor. Those, you can't go wrong with those. So the next page, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but just to maybe demystify what these things are, um, but the bond market. So you hear, you hear people say stocks and bonds, stock market, bond market. So as a general overview of what these are, these represent basically a loan to a corporation government, municipality, you are not an owner of those companies when you buy their bonds. So they're an IOU. So the companies are borrowing from you. And essentially, they're like, you could view them like a CD. So the company is borrowing, or the government is borrowing from you. There's a specified term, and then they'll pay you back at the end of the term what you put in, and then they'll pay interest along the way, typically every six months. So it's kind of like a CD. So depending on the issuer, you can make have higher interest rates or lower interest rates. So the lowest risk issuer is the federal government. So the government can always print more money. So then you're probably not going to default. So their interest rate is super, super low today. So a 10 year treasury note so if you buy one today, giving the US government money for 10 years, the interest rate on that per year is 1.6. So virtually no risk of default, but you only get 1.6. Then you could buy, instead of government bonds, you could buy a high quality corporate bond, PNG. So the yields on that are higher because in theory, PNG could default. They're not the federal government. They can't print money. So the, the yield will be a little bit higher. Then you could go to lower quality companies where you get a higher interest rate, but there's a higher probability, not, not super high, but higher probability of default on those bonds. So then you get into what is what are called junk bonds because they're lower risk, but you get paid more to compensate for that. So the role of bonds in a portfolio, historically, they've done a little bit better than bank accounts, than CDs. So for an investment portfolio, especially those who are retired, they need to have a portion of their nest egg in something that's safer. So it's not all in stocks. So bonds are usually the alternative for that. So, so some bonds also pay a regular oh, dividend, and you, you can use it for income. Yeah? Right, you get interest every six months. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they are usually the stable portion of a retirement nest egg. If you are saving for retirement, so it's not here yet, that we recommend not having much bond exposure at all, depending on your age, because it's not going to grow. But once you are retired, then it's prudent to have some. And depending on your situation, that could be more or less. And that's one of our jobs, and one of the things that I do, is to assess someone's risk tolerance, their cash flow needs, to map out what allocation they should have, what's appropriate for them. So. That's what the bond market is. And on the next page on how to invest in those, it's pretty similar. You could buy individual bonds. That would be highly discouraged for most people. Um, and bond mutual funds. 
a bond ETF, you could get exposure to different parts of the bond market. So you're not going to get rich off these. They can fluctuate a little bit um, depending on the level of interest rates. So I'll explain something to you here. If you don't get it, it's fine. But if interest rates go up in the world, then the value of your existing bonds go down because you've already locked in a rate with your bonds. So if rates go up, then all of a sudden the bonds you own are less attractive. So if you would try to sell them in the market, investors wouldn't give you as much because they could buy bonds in the market that are higher today. On the flip side, if interest rates go down, the bonds that you own are more valuable because the interest rate on those is higher. So it can fluctuate a little bit. But if you buy them and hold them, then you usually get your money back and then interest along the way. So, yeah, certain bonds like municipal bonds may not be subject to um, federal tax and sometimes state tax. The yields are lower if you don't have to pay taxes. So, for those in very high tax brackets, it can make sense to buy those. So, that's how municipalities make money. They issue bonds and then there's a tax break on them, so they don't have to pay as high as interest rates to that's investors. That's how they make money. That's how you pay for things like the West Virginia Correct. Uh, Correct. Oh, yep, so there's municipalities, there are, um, you can buy almost like utility, like sewage, you know, all those kind of things that are all municipal bonds. So depending on your tax bracket, they can make sense or not make sense. So other investments, um, stocks, bonds, the third would be real estate. So we don't count your house as part of that. So your house, for most people, that is where you live. And when you don't live there, you will live somewhere else. So if you live in a house today, then you're going to move to Landfair, Twin Towers. Well, some of what you sell, the proceeds from your house, will go towards Twin Towers for the down payment and your monthly expense there. So we look at your house as that's going to cover your living expenses while you're alive. So we don't view that as part of your nest egg that's, that you're going to tap. Now, the only difference would be if if you live in Indian Hill, you sell your house for $2 million, and then you downsize to a condo. Then part of that's going to go into your nest, I'm sure. But for most people, whatever they have in the house, they're going to use that for living somewhere. But from an investment perspective, you can also invest in rental properties, commercial properties. You could, you could buy those yourselves. You can rent them. You can buy mutual funds that own real estate. Most of our clients do not do that. Some do, but they require effort if you own a rental property. And you have to be willing to deal with all that rental property entails. And so a lot of people don't want to deal with that, but you can make money there. Um, another one that's used as a diversifier would be precious metals. So that would be either buying gold coins or whatever, or you could buy funds or ETFs that track those. So those are usually used as a hedge. So again, certain outcomes, um, some people believe that they can add value. Um, if you really have a doom and gloom view of the world, then precious metals could be a part of the portfolio. It could still be part of the portfolio in a smaller extent, even, even if you don't have that viewpoint. Um, Just that, curious, what's the, what's the historic return on precious metals? Um, you know, it's interesting. If you look at different time frames, um, sometimes they, they can do pretty well. So over the last 10 years prior to, so the prior 10 years ending 2020, 
precious metals and stocks actually they're very comparable. Now it all depends on the time frame. Um, so longer term stocks have been better, but there are periods when sentiment can cause precious metals to really do well. What's interesting right now related to cryptocurrencies is um, some of the money that historically went into precious metals as a hedge against currency devaluation or all kinds of issues with governments and some of that money now is going into cryptocurrencies. So it's an interesting situation now where um, will all the money that investors historically put in metals, will it continue to go into crypto as an alternative? So crypto, and I'm not an expert on it, we don't buy it for our, for our clients, but it's basically digital money. And so it's outside of the system. So no government has any involvement in it. Um, it's its own exchange, it's unregulated. And those who buy it, some of it's pure speculation, um, but those who buy it could view it as a hedge against our government just printing money and turning into Germany of 1920 or Venezuela. So if you have if you have cryptocurrency, then you're immune from that. So it's also used by kind of the dark underworld. I mean, if if you're a drug cartel, you don't have to worry about money laundering with crypto because no money's filtering through the banking system. It's all on a digital platform. So the mafia, all those kind of things, they can just conduct business via cryptocurrency and no one can no one can track them. So it's kind of a new world with that. We'll see. There's lots of different cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is the most famous, but there's hundreds of different cryptocurrencies. China recently, this is in the summer, China basically said, we're going to try to ban it for conducting business in China. And Bitcoin took a huge hit afterwards. So it dropped around 30, low 30s, 30,000 per Bitcoin. And then today it closed at 66,000. So it's going to be all over the place. I don't know, but we're not, we're not buying it for clients at this point. So it's a whole new world. What, what is its value? I mean, how does it gain value? I can understand stocks are buying mm -hmm. into a company that's producing something or serving some of what? Well, there's a market for it. Okay. So it's just supply and demand. So there's a fixed amount of Bitcoin. Uh -huh. It's 21 million Bitcoins out there. Uh -huh. So it's okay. fixed. Uh -huh. So as people want more of it, mm -hmm. price goes up. Mm -hmm. I perceive the pessimistic about what traditional markets going to do. It's going to yeah. drive that up. It's yeah. It's a place of building. Right. Sure. Exactly. And those that have not gone up. Gold and silver, this real This and this has got a life of its own yeah, in terms right. of yeah. being a right. popular uh, investment. But for people who don't know anything about investing, you go on any website, you get a scene ad for oh, yeah. mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies. At least I do. Yeah. And I don't buy stuff like that. So we'll see. Yeah. It's a tough one to, to really. Evaluate. Yeah. You know, it's not traditional measures. Like we can look at PNG stock today. We have all kinds of measures that would tell us is it expensive or not? All kinds of different measures. But Bitcoin, you can't. I mean, it just depends on what sum it is and what demand is for it. So I don't know. But if in doubt, our, our view is. You don't have to be successful in investing with a really sophisticated plan. You can be very successful with a simple plan. So make sure you have the right amount in stocks for your situation, your point in life, for your objectives. There are ways to do that that are simple, that are inexpensive, and then you let the stock market do its thing for you. So you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be Warren Buffett. You just have to have a plan. You have to have discipline to save. Um, 
you have to make it happen. But then once you are disciplined, then the market will do its thing for you. So you can be very successful without being an investment genius. So that really leads into my last page. Um, have a plan for the future, map out short, medium, long-term needs. Make sure your assets, make sure your money is aligned with those objectives. The right mix of stocks, bonds, cash. Let stocks do their thing. Participate in the free enterprise system. Again, this is really something that I share with clients. I share with my kids. I've, I've done this at, at classes and churches and schools. It's you have to participate in this. You have to participate in the stock market. You have to participate in the free enterprise system and you don't have to have a lot of money to get started. And the longer you wait, the harder it is to make up the ground. The earlier you start, the more compounding will benefit you. So it's just something that you have to participate in if you want to grow wealth. And wealth is not bad. We talked about that before. God wants us to have money that we can use to build his kingdom. He doesn't just put money on trees outside of College Hill Presbyterian that you go pick off to pay the bills. It's coming from people. Church budgets are funded by people. So God wants Christians to have money so we can in turn help others, help churches build the kingdom. So he wants us to be wise. He wants us to be prudent. He wants us to be successful in investing. We need to do our part, but he wants that because where does the money come from? It comes from us. So if and now keep it simple, keep in mind the end objective. So it's not about, Barry, you mentioned the barns. It's not about how many barns can I have or I want to build a barn so I can start putting money in it. It's not about that. It's about taking care of yourself, your family, reasonably for the future. Those are all prudent things. But then saying the excess, how can I use it? To help other people be a blessing to them. Help build the kingdom. So that's what it's ultimately all about. It's, it's stewardship. And we're entrusted with not just money, but we're entrusted with ability, we're, we're entrusted with time. God expects, expects us to make the most of those talents and money's a component of that. So we wanna be wise in all of them. And at the end of the day, God blesses us for that. And then when we stand before him, we say, you are a good manager of what was entrusted to us. So, None of us are perfect. None of us will ever be perfect at that, but there's plenty of guidance in the Bible, plenty of guidance in Christian books that help us. Um, and it's not something, and this is, this is a tangent, but it's treasures in heaven. Could we get blessings along the way? I'm not sure, but it's not that we give to get immediate blessing now, but it's restoring where moth and rust do not destroy. And that is, that is the best investment. So when I work with Christian clients, we work out charitable giving plans. And sometimes I'll have clients who are giving beyond their budget. And I never discourage them from doing that. I never do that. So if you want to give more, if this is what a sustainable withdrawal rate is, but if you want to give more, if that's what God has called you to do, I would never discourage you from doing that because that's your best investment. And then when Christians ask me, like, what do you, what do you think about the future? What, what looks good? And I said, even if, even if you knew what the next Amazon was, or even if you knew what the, the next Bitcoin was, because Bitcoin 10 years ago was like, it was less than $100 a Bitcoin. Now it's 66,000. Even if you knew in advance what the next Amazon, Bitcoin, Apple was, your best investment is just giving it to the kingdom because that's what God's watching. So 
it's the two coins that the widow put in. I mean, that's that's the best investment. So what we do with the other money, we want to be smart, we want to be wise, but that is the best investment. So that's what I'll leave you with. Thanks. Um, uh, what, what kind of advice do you give around the ethics of investing? Since you are owning part of a company, you're now participating mm -hmm. in some way in that what that company is, is doing. And of course, everybody has yeah. different sets of ethics and understanding of what's That is a really good question. Because it's becoming popular, what is called ESG um, investing. So um, environmental, social governance. But everybody has a different view. Yeah. Um, so it's very difficult, especially if you're diversifying. So if you're buying a broad-based market fund, you're buying everything. So it's really difficult to eliminate companies that may do something. But there are mutual funds that, that avoid all kinds of things that specialize in you know, clean energy yep. and sustainable stuff and yep. group friendly and we will really avoid things like tobacco stocks and gambling stocks yep. and stuff like that. So I'll tell you what we do at Johnson and you may have a per different view, um, and everyone has a, maybe has a little different view on this. Um, we we basically we don't invest in pharmaceutical companies, and this is our point of view. That almost so we invest in medical devices companies. So we have Medtronic, we have Zimmer, we you know to make all the things for hip replacements and knee replacements. Um, <clears throat> We have a company that looks that invest in, in advancements in eye technology. The pharmaceuticals, almost every one is involved with fetal research from aborted fetuses in some fashion or another. And it's our point of view at Johnson that we don't invest in this. So Pfizer's, Merck's, Moderna's, you just go all the way down. We don't invest in. So we don't invest in alcohol stocks, even though Jesus converted water. water. <laughs> um, gambling stocks we don't invest in directly. Now, we do invest in baskets of stocks that represent different segments. So we have, so for medium-sized companies, small-sized companies, we have funds that we invest with for our clients in those funds that are broad based that have companies that do that. So it's very difficult to avoid um, that there are some funds that are very restrictive on certain things, but then those are not representative of broad markets. So we're more representative of broad markets, um, but when we're buying individual stocks for clients, we try to be as careful as we can. Then if a client says, you know, I don't like oil stocks. Well, we don't buy whatever. So we'll, we'll be sensitive to that. But as a rule, our clients don't own pharmaceuticals. So and some, for some of our clients, they don't get that. So we just don't. With your uh, <clears throat> position on pharmaceuticals, is also fetal tissue mm -hmm. from aborted abortion yep would not that be an area where the churches should be taking a more firm stand in a position against abortion that well i won't go there because <laughs> no, i'm just saying from we as people who are christian and who look at what has happened as a result of abortion, the number of babies aborted, which is in 67 million babies, with that being a political issue today of abortion in this country, if the churches took a stand against that, 
that could alleviate that kind of activity because it would not be as available. Yeah, and I won't. I, I know. I'm just. Yeah. That's my belief. Yeah. So from a from an investment perspective, it does get very tricky because there was a time where PNG had a healthcare unit, and so if you're in healthcare, you're not you can't avoid that. Mm -hmm. um, so we we held we held PNG then because it was relatively really small. It's really hard to know where to draw the line, and um, there's all kinds of different things you can restrict or do. But um, but as owners of stocks, it's something to be mindful of. I think that's that's very important. Well, and then the, where I'm at in regard to that is that the pharmaceutical industries have created vaccines similar to what happened in polio. Now today, which is what is bringing back the defense of the body to be able to fight against the COVID. Yeah. Virus. So there's a. It gets complicated. It's a complicated yeah. line. Long. Yeah. But we have to look at the benefit of what happens yeah. in today's world. Yeah. It gets complicated. In a lot of areas. Yeah. So we're not trying to impose our morals on people, but they're just things that it's a firm we just don't do. And if clients really don't like it, then they can go somewhere else. I mean, it just. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. I'm curious, you know, you said you don't necessarily have to be super rich to uh -huh. invest, but what would you say would be a, a good amount beginning investment if you had children or if I have, you know, young people that we mentor or mm -hmm. things like that? How much would you say would be needed to be gathered to begin? Well, to start, you don't need much at all. I mean, you can open up a brokerage account. I mean, five hundred dollars, you could start. You could start investing. You know, two hundred fifty dollars, you could start investing. But the the general answer is as much as you can, because mm -hmm. especially for younger people, the earlier you start, the compounding works, and then it just starts to steamroll for you. So, as much as you can. So it's working through a budget, and part of Part of a budget, the way you have to look at it is you have to say, instead of saying, I will just save whatever's left, because sometimes there won't be any left, you say, part of my budget off the top is going to be saving. So you start with saving, tithing first. Then you spend what is left, rather than saying, well, I'll get to saving and tithing if there's money at the end of the month. Yeah. Yeah. Because there may not be money at the end of the month. But if you start with those things first, then you do it. So, so I encourage people to flip it. Uh, do you or Dennis own uh, any resources for children? Children. I don't. I should, but I don't. My thought is, is there a way to, um, by, you know, giving a child Well, I'd say for children, and this is just a personal thing, like child, so not like middle school. But yeah. I mean, it's the it's the envelope approach where if you have some, if you get money for chores, you spend a little, you save a little, you give a little. You have three envelopes. Just teaching them to compartmentalize their money. So at a young age, that's a good one because they're thinking that I have money. There's different places where it should go, rather than it just all goes in the piggy bank, that some of it goes to church, some of it I can enjoy, some of it's for something that I want to get later. So that basic concept, if you can instill that, then that will carry over until, you know, throughout their lifetime, if they can think like that, start to mentally segment their money. And then envelopes help, helps people do that. So that's the way my parents were raised. They actually did that. They said, when we grew up, we had the envelopes. We knew how much we could spend. We knew how much we were going to get. And the kids can grasp that. 
Thank so, you, Tim. So I will break. Yeah. Thank you for your attentiveness. Yeah. And yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah.